Hello everybody, what's up and welcome to episode 78 of Into the Necrosphere. My guest on this installment of the podcast is the great Blake Harrison of Pig Destroyer. Blake had plenty to say about the last Pig Destroyer record, Head Cage, uh, as well as a bunch of other topics, and I had plenty of time to listen. So stick around because this was a good one. Also, coming up later in the show, I will be reviewing Paradema by the Chechen uh, black metal badasses Inferno. Uh, One of my favorite records of the year so far, and you will find out why in just an hour's time. Uh, And then straight after that, I'm going to be talking about some news. And if you've been following metal news recently, then you'll know that we have plenty to talk about, uh, particularly uh, vis-a-vis a a former uh, Into the Necrosphere guest. So uh, I'll be discussing that in a lot of detail um, straight after my review of the new Inferno. Um, Before we get to that, however, just a couple of quick announcements. If you are new to the podcast uh, and you are not yet subscribed, uh, then do be aware that I post new episodes every Tuesday for free to YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, uh, and basically every other decent podcasting service around. Frankly speaking, if uh, if your favorite podcasting service doesn't host the show, that is because because it sucks. So uh, uh, comment, like, subscribe, share, do all of those great things. Uh, and if you really like the show, then head over to uh, my Teespring store, the link of which is in the description of the podcast, and you can pick yourself out an Into the Necrosphere t-shirt, a hoodie, a jogger, or whatever else catches your fancy. Um, and uh, if you do go out wearing it uh, and you tag me on uh, the socials, then uh, I may well hit you up uh, with a little surprise. So, uh, yeah, keep uh, keep tagging me on those photos. Uh, thanks to everyone who has bought uh, some stuff so far. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's not there to, uh, to make me rich, but, uh, you know, whatever money I make out of the Teespring store does get plowed back into making the show look and sound even better than it already does. Um, speaking of the socials, uh, I am on social media, so follow the show on Instagram or Facebook at uh, Into the Necrosphere and on Twitter at iNecrosphere. Um, I tend to post a bunch of stuff there about upcoming guests, music that I'm into, etc., etc. So, uh, again, uh, for those that are on those uh, platforms following me and are sharing my content, I massively appreciate it. Uh, Much as I massively appreciate everyone who is tuned in, uh, and I suspect you are going to very much appreciate the conversation you're about to hear. So, uh, strap yourselves in, buckle up. This is Blake Harrison of Big Destroyer. I think you and I are probably in the same boat as far as uh, as far as that's concerned. Because I, I mean, I, I effectively operate, you know, in in part as a consultant. I mean, in part, I, I manage quite a significant team. But it's it's having to have those types of conversations where you're advising people, and you know, really by speaking to you, they should know that, that you know you're you're talking to them with their best interests at heart. And then they act like you're doing them an injury. It uh, it, it, it tests tests your patience. I mean, uh, you know, I can use an example. Uh, I design a lot of conference rooms and executive boardrooms. And, you know, when you have a table that's, you know, 20 feet long and you're going to be showing spreadsheets and like documents, financial documents, I'm like, well, you need a, you know, 85 inch TV. They're like, does it need to be that big? I'm like, well, do you want to see it from the back of the room? Or do you, you know, want everyone to move up when you spent $20,000 on this table? Yeah. You want everyone to sit right in front of it. Like you can do whatever you want, but like, I don't advise it. Uh, You know, I, I did the Ravens training facility was the big one for me. And it's just me and my boss. Uh, And I mean, they, you know, the Ravens have tons of money and, you know, they like nitpicked every single thing. And I'm like, dude, this is what you told me you need. So this is what it costs. I can't change that. I don't, I don't buy the equipment. I don't sell the equipment to you. Um, if you don't want it, it's just not going to work the way you want. <laughs> that's, that's, that's some, you know, pretty serious kudos though. Having, uh, having done that, did, did you get any perks out of that as in, you know, game invites and things like that? Uh, I'm not a sports guy. Like I'm an old punk rocker. Um, but no, they wouldn't do that. I worked on, uh, my previous job was before I was an engineer, like kind of did the installs for this sort of stuff. I did a ton of stadiums and I did one, uh, the Eagles in Philly and it did get a perk there because uh, Bruce Springsteen played and I, 
had to go into the stadium that day, quote unquote, uh, just so I could see the show. And it was kind of nuts. He had uh, three tractor trails that would leapfrog across the country. He had a fake boardwalk set up on the field. So if you had field seats, you could go buy peanuts and cotton candy and like at a fake boardwalk. It was pretty insane. He ruined the draft. But yeah, I mean, and he, you know, I would never pay for something like that. Like, no. you know, I love Bruce Springsteen, but I'm not paying like $200. Like concerts and quotes are not really my scene. Yeah. Um, but, you know, seeing it for free and watching it from like uh, the commentator room was pretty insane. Yeah, yeah. And the fuck I can imagine. I was about to say, oh, you know, midway through, you should have said, listen, I, there's a couple of things I need to check. I'll probably need to go stage right. <laughs> if you know, yeah, I'm I mean, going up the stairs. Especially in that kind of uh, situation, because, you know, people would say, well, you're not allowed back here. And I'm like, well, I represent the owner of the Eagles. And they'd be like, right this way, sir. <laughs> oh, Mr. Harrison, my apologies. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, that that was a, a good one. Um, and, you know, like doing the Ravens and stuff like that looks really good on my, my what you guys call a CV. <laughs> yeah a resume oh no right. I've, I've 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 acclimatized now so so i i look after my my day job now uh north america latin america um europe middle east and africa and and um asia pacific jesus I why don't that. they just give you uh australia <laughs> and like uh, australia's in there mates <laughs> oh, Jesus. I, I i i would say most of my time is concentrated on the u.s purely because most of our business is there um but uh yeah it's it's long long ass days mate it's fucking busy and i mean to do to do you know the 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 podcast and stuff like that i think this is part of why i've I've spoken about this on the show before part of why i try and avoid dealing with record labels and i'll just approach bands directly because having to go through the gatekeepers and have to put up with all of that bullshit it, it feels too much like a replication of my day job where this podcast is kind of it's my thing it's it's for fun i do it I do it DIY and, and and the way I've kind of always wanted to do something like this for a specific reason. And it's, it's not to replicate what I do in my, in my day to day. Right. I mean, fortunately, uh, if you did to get to pick destroyer, or go through the label, uh, I mean, they usually just send me an email. And I, I, you know, I can't remember the last time I said no to anything. Like I've literally done podcasts where like, or like a fit Instagram live where like the guy's just starting and there's two people watching. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's also easy for me as long as I can, like, you reach out to me and that's cool. I'll tell Relapse so they can pump it. But, uh, you know, typically it's just like, it's just a matter of time. I, I don't think I've ever, there was a guy that grew up in my hometown that asked me to do a fake, uh, like, courtroom thing where one guy defended new metal and one guy didn't. And I was the guy that didn't. And I was like, look, man, I've been on your podcast like seven times. Yeah. I'll talk about horror movies. I'll do whatever you want. But like, this is not up my alley. Yeah. Uh, being 45, uh, I'm not a big fan of new metal, but I'm also not trying to shit on other people's uh, tastes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I definitely feel I, I'm, I'm 41 now. And I, I, I felt like that at, at, at shows quite a lot. And I, I, do, I feel increasing like that when I, when, I, you know, when I see certain people online and I see, particularly on Twitter, you you started notice the distinction in 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 age like pretty significantly you know yeah you know i used to in my 20s it was just like you know your taste in music sucks and mine's the best and then as i grew up you know in fact i did a uh interview with a kid from the uk i didn't realize he was a kid um and i think it was his senior project uh and it was really cute because he was like I was like, well, I can get you in touch with a couple people. And it was like, yeah, usually they get turned off when they find out I'm 17. And I didn't know beforehand. And then his parents kind of popped in on the Zoom call. And the poor kid's like holding his head, shaking his head. And they're <laughs> like, oh, oh, do we hear you say you're from Florida? I'm like, no, I just came from Florida. They're like, oh, we drove through D.C. We uh, flew into Florida and flew out of New York. We didn't realize it was like 15 hours away. Like, yeah, man, America's pretty big compared to the UK. I, I was just about to say, dude, like, I, I don't know whether you, you notice this, but I, I find a lot of people that aren't particularly well-traveled, and it's true all over the world. I, mean, I, I said before, I, I speak to people all, all over the world. They will they will ask you where you're from or did you do this, and then I'll ask, oh, by the way, do you know John? It's like, you know, there's 69 million people living in South Africa. How the fuck am I going to know John that lives in such and such a place? Well, you know, in like, uh, especially 
in the US, it's so big and regional that like, you know, on the East Coast, I can start from Richmond and be in New York in like six hours. I can be in Canada in like nine, technically. Yeah. Uh, if you go to the West Coast, I mean, like LA and San Francisco, all that they don't look far that far apart. They're eight hours away. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, there's always like a lot of people like, oh, you're in LA. I'm in San Francisco. Come and visit me. I'm like, no, man, I'm playing the show and I'm like far. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. I can't just pop up. <laughs> like, yeah but i mean uh, the, the u.s i think is especially so because it has i mean it even has you know its own regional foods and things like that you know there's and, there's different and, uh, you mean, know different accents it's, it's it, it genuinely is like a load of different countries balled well, up into so, one i mean the uk has different accents that's true as well but i it, mean like it's same the same applies yeah the food just generally speaking sucks <laughs> yeah I mean, like the first time I was in the UK and everyone was like, oh, dude, they're northern. Don't worry about it. And I was like, what does that mean? They're like, oh, that's like your southerners, uh, you know, like kind of more redneck, less educated. Um, and I was like, oh, that's interesting. I never figured that out. Uh, but, yeah, I thought that was uh, pretty cool. Like, you know, like, oh, th they're manx. And I'm like, what does that mean? They're like, oh, dude, they're total punters and they're idiots. So I'm like, oh, well, I'm not terribly afraid <laughs> yeah no I, I i i'm trying to think how i experienced it when i came here i think i think it wasn't as big of a shock to me as it is to some because i grew up watching a lot of english movies and english tv and things like that so the the accents didn't throw me as much but it it, it, it is pretty different i mean Man, you know, manchester versus london is you know worlds apart well for uh, me uh you know uk and and europe in general is it's just like it's a little culture shock, you know, it's not the language and the communication. It's just like, you know, one thing I, I, I always call it, you know, like mainland Europe, the land of inconvenience. Uh, you know, I'm like, all right, well, we're in the hotel. Where's the ice machine? You ask, they're like, oh, this is not possible. You're like, okay, I want to go get a bottle of gin and then I want tonic water and getting iced. You have to go to three different places. Yeah. You know, but you know, it's not without it's, that's marriage you know i i personally am a very anti-american the corporate cor corporatization the corporate image of america um and you know it's i try to spend my money not necessarily locally but smaller but you know sometimes when you got to run out and get something it's nice to go to like one place instead of four <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, I I agree with you. You have more of that corporatization in in the UK, but um, you know, de de depending on where you live, obviously. I live in a horse ranch in the middle of nowhere, so uh, I've got where, nothing. And where is that? <clears throat> so I, I I used to live in uh or in in and and or near London, but I now live about if if you kind of it's probably to give you the best idea, it's probably about an hour or so away from Oxford. Um, okay, but it's I mean the the closest house is a mile away. So oh wow. That being said, I get all my food from Costco because that's about a half an hour away. And as far as meat and stuff like that, like the quality of their meat is way better than most places you can get. Well, and then there. in the UK, you guys don't believe in straight roads. No. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no. And, you know, like speaking to your earlier point, like I think that the world is getting smaller, you know, like the first time I went to the UK 17 years ago, it was much different, you know, uh, you know, I did the word lift and, you know, Lori and the Lou, that was way more used than like the last time I went, which was, I don't know, probably five years ago. Like, okay, well, we, we get your, your American and you don't know what the fuck a Lou is. No, I do. But, um, but my big problem is ice, man. <laughs> <laughs> like, but I, I, I think the land of inconvenience is a, is a fucking great description though, because everything is so the, like I, 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 I've lived here now for 21 years and I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll die in England. Um, you know, hopefully in a very long time from now, but I'll live here forever. But the, the, some of the stuff that, that just drives you nuts in, particularly in comparison to the U S is everything gets done on such a small scale, but, you know, the people that do it are so quick to, to pat themselves on the back for doing it. Um, <laughs> It, it's 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 one of the most bizarre like forms of self congratulation you've ever seen in your entire life. You know, it'll be like um, they they'll make a massive deal about the fact that there's a Wendy's opening in London. It's like, whoa, amazing! Brits can have we can make burgers too. Wendy's opening up in London. It's like, who gives a shit? 
Right. Um, you know, it, 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 it'd be bizarre stuff like that. But, you know, I think also the, the you know, I kind of come as a, as an outsider because in, 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 uh, in South Africa, at least as you know, where I was growing up, you you definitely have an intersection of the American and English culture. Um, right. So you kind of experience both, um, you know, in 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 one melting pot. A lot of a lot of people's ancestry goes back to England, but obviously the American culture in 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 South Africa is huge. So you know. So uh, when you listen to Diane Word, do you know what they're saying when they? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. wow, that's crazy. Yeah, which makes it even I mean, more hysterical because a lot of it's fucking funny. I mean, right. you know, and and it's funny in the context, more so South Africa. Like I remember when um, Evil Boy came out, you know, there was this big backlash. They're homophobic, this, that, and the other. And I mean, a lot of it is 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 jokes. You I know, mean, they 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 genuinely are just fucking around. And and you know, in South Africa, most people will see it as a lot of people will, will either kind of you know look down their nose at it, um, you know, and other people will will just think, oh, this is hysterical, and which which I do. I mean, they, they, I remember they they did that first. Um, like when they were first on the scene, they did this video where it was just them in like a um, a minivan <laughs> cruising around the streets of Cape Town, and they were just singing I mean, the as, song in the minivan. For as big as they are, they definitely, you know, you can kind of see that like just ninja dressing just in his boxers, like they're, it's tongue in cheek. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I yeah. do. I mean, uh, they're, 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 not, they're, not, they're not genuinely like that. They used to be in another band. I can't remember the name, but the the band used to basically be like a like a a satire of like uh corporate self-help corporate training videos wow and 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 ninja used to come on i'll need to i'll need to try and find it and and then send it to you ninja used to come on uh he he would come on like music videos and then have like powerpoint presentations that he goes through and then he like like raps through it's like right up my alley man i love like stupid concept bands i mean i'm the dude that brought hate beak to the world i was just about to say it came up Um, with hate beak yeah but i i don't want to I think I'm getting off topic. I still wanted to talk about the getting ice in the UK. Uh, I think the first time we played, it was still when the pubs closed at 10. Oh, so our, yeah, shows, yeah, yeah. our shows closed at 10 and then it would turn into a dance club. And I think we were just so jet lagged. Uh, I got like a Red Bull and vodka and was like, I want you to put ice in it. And they put like one ice cube. I'm like, no, nah, man, I'm American. Can you put some ice in it? I'll tip you. And then, you know, that's shocking because it's not a tipping culture. And they put like two more and was like, no, 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 no. Pour the drink out, scoop the glass in the ice, fill it with ice, <laughs> yeah. pour the drink back in. And then I like just snap. I'm like, look, I play bass on Weezer. I don't need this bullshit. <laughs> and uh, I don't even know that guy's name. And all these people kept coming up to me and asking for my autograph. So I would just sign my name. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I would definitely say it's, it, in, in that regard, it's gotten a lot better um you know since since when i when i moved here uh and actually i made a joke about the food earlier the food's better now than it was but i was also i was in california two years ago and it was my first trip to the u.s and um i mean just just on a just just on a food level it was fucking fantastic services way different way you know, better i'm not a very adventurous eater in fact i'm pretty picky so the food in the uk isn't too bad for me because i really like i mean overcooked bland food um oh really because- I don't like it. It's just what I prefer. Uh, you yeah. know, my mom couldn't cook, still can't. So I just kind of grew up that way. But yeah, I definitely get it. Like, I mean, I like bland food and the UK food is blander than most. But when I was in Australia, I saw yeah. shredded carrots on pizza. So that's fucked up. <laughs> I was about to say that's, that's, that's wrong. I, I'm, 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 I'm as as uh, controversial it is, as as it is, I, I'm not averse to pineapple on a pizza. I actually quite like it, but um, pineapple, shredded shredded um, carrots on a pizza. Yeah, dude. And I mean, like when we were in the UK, we we got offered this cooking show uh, where we play. We're supposed to play, and uh, the chef would cook. And they asked about uh, crazy food tour stories, and the two stories I told were the UK, and one was blood pudding and either haggis or blood no i've never had blood sausage so it was haggis but both stories ended up with me and scott puking <laughs> so needless to say they were like a uh, piece of advice man uh if you want to get on a cooking show don't tell stories where you're puking <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh dude I, I i couldn't eat haggis just the smell of it is so fucking disgusting uh, yeah I'm it's really with it. i mean we have weird specialties in 
you know, regional specialties here that I won't touch. But yeah, I I don't know what was in me, man. I just was like, all right, I'll take a bite. And it was, you know, <laughs> it's also UK is a very drinking culture and I, I love Guinness. So I'm not going to say that being hungover wasn't part of both of the puking stories. <laughs> 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 well, no, I, I do the quickest way. I think to, to, if, if I were hung over to have Guinness, oh, I'm sorry, Haggis, I can't think of anything worse. Yeah, um, and then you know, blood, blood pudding too, man. That was pretty. Uh, you're I talking about I black, think, black pudding, like the yes, 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 yeah, I am. Yeah. Um, you know, which, which people was, swear by, and as much as I, I'm a diehard meat eater, but fuck me, so I, am can't, I. I can't stomach that shit. You know, I, I like typically shy away from vegetables i'm trying to go more uh plant-based meats uh just because it's so much better for the environment and uh i love animals man but my diet uh just won't doesn't support it man uh i try to there was a you know 10 15 years ago a big documentary here about you know tied to health and americans diet and i refuse to watch it because i'm like then i'll just never eat yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) like well, I, 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 I've, I've seen a couple of those. I mean, I'm dubious of a lot of that shit because I'll, I'll give you my own personal experience with, with red meat in particular. So I, I mean, I've always been a, been a big meat eater, but I've always eaten a lot of crap as well. There's a guy um, based out of Las Vegas called Stan Efferding. Um, and I've, I, I've, I, I would listen to a lot of his podcasts and stuff. And I've, I've often said, if you want to, you can pick up more from a one hour interview this guy gives than you will from seven, seven or eight health books. And he was talking and, send, and that, he, send that to me too when you yeah, uh, yeah well I will he was debunking a lot of the the myths around red meat and around uh, things like that and you know talking about how like some of the studies around red meat is funded by things like the sugar lobby and stuff like that but one of the things that he he prescribes is is you know if you are looking to build muscle if you've got blood pressure issues etc cetera, etc cetera, is up your intake of red meat you know keep your you know carb source clean you know and then he's got a couple of other things that he that he puts in there but the day that I I switched from you know eating you know probably a variety of different meats to eating a lot of beef and you know having that with vegetables and rice and stuff like that every single day, I've never felt I've never ever felt better. Way more I mean, energy. Part of that is due to blood type. Um, yeah. But you know, in uh, I don't know how it is in the UK, but I can say in Europe in general, uh it tastes better and I feel like meat is healthier for you because they don't pump it full of steroids and hormones as much as they yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and there's something to be said about that. I mean, I had a ham, cheese and butter sandwich in France and it was probably the best sandwich I've ever had yeah. because the butter was probably, you know, the milk didn't have anything in it. Uh, probably, you know, hand, hand churn and homemade. And, you know, the, the ham was probably not pumped with steroids and the bread was probably, you know, all of it was just natural tasting, and it was amazing. Yeah. No, I, I the, the 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 moment that I I switched to, and I do try and stick to you know free range. Um, I mean, I I, I tend to have dry aged uh, steak as much as I can because I like the, the flavor of it. But um, when I switched to to you know more beef in my diet, I just felt way better. Numbers of the you know because I, I I I used to train quite a lot before COVID. So, you know, I would, I would track my, my progress at the gym. My numbers went way up. I mean, I even ditched most of my supplements. The only thing that I continue to have is a multivitamin. Um, and, I, right. and I have some extra vitamin D. But beyond that, I ditched all of that as well. And I still feel way better. So no more creatine, no more protein shakes, none of that bullshit. Just like stay. I said, man, I think it's, a, it's a, a blood type thing that, you know, science hasn't really figured out. Like, yeah. Uh, you know, if you need iron, you eat red meat or you tend to want it. Like I never crave a salad ever in my life. And Not I don't either. like vegetables. Um, so, you know, I'll drink them in smoothies because I know I need them. But uh, I never, you know, in my head or to anyone say, you know what would hit the spot? Uh, Good the salad. salad. Or like cucumber. <laughs> you know, being from Maryland, uh, yeah. I'm not really into seafood. But once a year, I crave Maryland crabs. And it's like, when I crave it, it's like a drug addiction almost. It's like, I need that now. And then I eat a couple and I'm good for you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So dude, let, let, let's let's talk Pig Destroyer. You guys obviously just dropped uh, Pornographers of Sound, which uh, which you recorded at St. Vitus. I actually watched, by the way, 
uh, a clip of a uh, show that you guys did at St. Vitus in 2014. I know this. I know this. This uh, pornographers of a sound um, album was was done later. Um, but on one of the uh, parts of the show, JR is actually warning the crowd. You know, warning p- people in the crowd that you know the folks in the front are getting crushed. Um, I, I was going to ask you just as far as like shows are concerned, because I've seen I've seen Pig Destroyer live once, but that was back in like. 2005 2006 it okay, might have been so a little bit later it might actually have been when you when you've mentioned coming here for the first time before i was in the band i was just with them yeah 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 but the the i mean the pig destroyer music generally is designed for violence <laughs> so what's the craziest thing that you've seen at a show you know how, how nuts has it gotten um i mean it's gotten pretty nuts there's a couple that stick out in my mind uh we played maryland death fest a couple of years ago and uh, people were throwing trash cans. Uh, the crowd outnumbered us and the stagehands on stage because they got up to help us. Uh, but we kind of, you know, as long as no one's getting hurt, uh, we really kind of, you know, good, friendly, violent fun. Um, we played the barbecue a couple, out of probably going back more like seven, eight years. And we played a gazebo. And uh, I got separated from my equipment because there's so many people on and stages and quotes yeah and uh people were hanging from the rafters and it was shaking and i thought it was going to come down i mean we played miami where i don't think anyone from the crowd was on the floor yeah, they were on yeah. The um so that type of stuff is great we don't mind getting jostled around a little bit uh you know with me it's more my equipment uh i've had a couple mishaps where i've deleted stuff by mistake trying to catch myself but in general you know, being in our forties, except for Travis, uh, you know, we, we, we want the crowd to have fun and that's part of expression. We just don't want anyone to go home in a stretcher. Um, yeah. you know, well, our record release, at in New York a couple of years ago for head cage, somebody broke their leg and, uh, we didn't know. So we didn't stop the show, but we definitely would have, um, you know, that type of stuff is not fun. Uh, but we definitely, you know, stage diving and all that stuff is is heavily encouraged. And we tried to play places without barriers or with a no stage diving. And how do I say this? Where they don't care about stage diving. We try to do that yeah, sort yeah, of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But sometimes it's avoidable. I mean, you know, we try to do all ages shows. Sometimes that's avoidable. It depends on the jurisdiction. Yeah. And you, you have quite a lot of regulation around stage diving and stuff like that in the US, right? It depends. Um you know, I think it's more of an insurance uh, issue here. Uh, like I live in DC and there's, it's very strict, but there's not like a law. It's just, you know, if you bust your stall, you know, look, I, here's the good point. So when we were at the garage, probably the tour you saw, um, chair stage dove in the crowd and bruised a bone. Uh, so we were able to take him to the hospital. It was free to us. And there was no liability on the garage's part here there's liability yeah, yeah so yeah. it's not encouraged i mean there was one show where we did not go i'm like i want to see all you guys on stage and the sound guy's like uh you can't say that <laughs> uh so yeah. you can't like really encourage that uh so we try to get away with it in different ways <laughs> yeah you no, no, no longer the days of being able to yell at a crowd saying fuck this place up <laughs> i mean you can but you can't tell them to get on stage and uh yeah. you know uh, so we just try to you know there's ways around it but yeah yeah yeah, we encourage that like we we love that fun and interact with the crowd uh but you know people breaking their legs getting seriously hurt is not super fun and and there's i mean i agree with you there's definitely a balance you know you don't want you don't want people getting hurt you don't want people i mean you don't want fights or anything like that but it is it is crazy to me over the over the years noticing how much less dangerous the shows have gotten um and i don't think it's necessarily just regulation i've spoken to quite a lot of uh, mike and i spoke about spoke about this and we were saying that i think in part people don't go as crazy at shows anymore because they no longer have to to part with physically part with money to buy music um you know for the most part and so therefore that degree of emotional and personal investment in the band and and that passion that people felt is, is just not it's just not there anymore I think that's part of it. And I also think that um, extreme music in general is way more accessible than it ever has been. Yeah. So, you know, when I was a kid, uh, you know, 
I hate the word mosh pit, but you know, they were very dangerous because you were so passionate about the music. And, you know, I probably weighed when I was in high school, like one Oh three. So I wouldn't fuck with that at all. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, I mean, I saw some dangerous stuff and you know, it was, it, you really had to search out and this speaks to what you and Mike were talking about. You really had to search out that kind of music. You don't yeah. kind of fall into it and be like, Oh, I like this. This is cool. You know, you, it was more of a, dedication uh yeah you know or a lifestyle choice but even if you watch you, you watch a video like uh, sod live at the budokan i mean that was fucking brutal i mean aside from the fact that you know, billy is beating up people in the audience with this microphone <laughs> i mean just the, the 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 crowd literally from the second that they start march of the sod that crowd is is like a fucking it's like a gang fight <laughs> it's, 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 I mean, it's, you, it's you, nuts but you probably can't name a more moshable record than that one <laughs> no, no, that 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 is true, and it, it was always my dream, and I'll forever be pissed off about it. That I, my, I I'd always had a plan to start a grind band and and cover March of the SOD, literally just for the feeling of being on stage and and having and playing that riff. Oh, I was actually me and Sparky from Dying Fetus and Misery Index were going to do one, and uh, we were going to open with Freddy Krueger, and I was going to sing and come out dressed like Freddy. Yeah, uh, but we never did. <laughs> But uh, I mean, I, I do think like again, a part of me does 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 miss it a bit. I miss a bit of the craziness. I remember seeing Slayer the first time over here, and you know that that feeling of seeing that crowd just explode when the band yeah. came on stage, and then you- Slayer in particular, like yeah, you know, because they attract. I don't want to say mainstream, but like a lot of people that aren't necessarily into super extreme music. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, not like Megadeth or Metallica now, which attracts like your drunk uncle that can hear some of that stuff on the radio. Yeah. Uh, you know, like the Slayer pits have always been super violent. You're right. It's like the first note, the whole thing just pops off. Yeah. 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 So any, any, any bands that would bring you out of mosh retirement? No. Um, I'm 45. I've got a really bad back. Uh, you know, I saw integrity a couple of years ago and I moved a little bit, but, coming out of mosh retirement is a strong term for that for yeah, what i was yeah. doing uh yeah no probably not <laughs> no i i so there's two for me so biohazard when i saw them the last time I, I i i got involved for the entirety of the show you you cannot cannot not be involved at a biohazard show and then um uh, despised icon actually of all bands they they did a track called retina and they've got like a breakdown at the end where I just, uh, I was like, fuck this. I just dove in. I think that was the first time in seven years that I got that involved. But um, so, so being in your 40s, does that mean like, uh, for say, for example, that's a good point. Like, you're, are you like in your head, like if they play this one track, I'm definitely doing it. If not, yes. I'll just hang in the back and, and have a pint. Well, that's kind of how I've always been, to be, <laughs> to be honest. Right. I've never, I've, 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 it's, besides uh, Biohazard, I wouldn't be like a duration of the show type type guy i mean like you always see there's always those two three three guys that shows with their shirts off that i mean they're going to be involved for the for the whole two hours and it doesn't matter what happens how do they do that how do they go to work the next day (laughs) well i think frankly many of them don't have jobs (laughs) but it's well if uh if we play the uk man and there's one of our songs that would do that let us know and we'll try to learn it Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, there's a there's a bunch of stuff off Ed Cage and 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 uh, Terrify. I mean, like, there's. I, I was going to ask you about the Pig Destroyer writing process because there's always bits on every single album where, like, you know, knowing knowing conversations I've had with other bands where they'll say like, we'll write this bit knowing like this is going to you know bring bring a certain response out of a crowd. You always hear those breakdowns and those groovy parts and just. You know, just just like these 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 moments that you know are are just created for for organized chaos. How 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 does the how does the collaboration how does the writing process um, work in Pig Destroyer and how involved are you in in, in how songs are put together? Well, this will be probably pretty boring. Um, so Scott demos everything. He writes the guitar and the drums, um, which Adam can change. Uh, he does some. Uh, but not always. Uh, Jer writes and arranges his lyrics, and I write my parts. Uh, Travis just kind of plays what Scott either writes or plays what Scott plays. So it's not, we are involved as far as like sometimes arrangements go, but usually um, 
we kind of talk about it before we start. Like, for example, Head Cage uh, kind of shows Scott's more jazzy influences where it's like subtle variations on a theme and it's a lot more of a groovier record. In fact, to me, the three or four grindcore tracks that are on that record are great, but they stick out. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't seem like a cohesive record. Uh, I mean, that's like Scott's uh, Confessor influence and Breadwinner and stuff like that. So, uh, I mean, there, there, there are things um, that we all contribute. Uh, like we're writing right now and the stuff that Scott has demoed is short and fast and I've listened to it a bunch and it still hasn't, it's great. It just hasn't stuck with me. I'm like, oh shit, I forgot about this part. Oh shit, I forgot about this part. Um, but you know, there's like a, there's definitely, you know, there's like blur grindcore is what I call it, um, which sometimes is great. It's just super intense, but you don't have any riffs. Uh, the Doom is the same way. It doesn't take a super genius to play fast or just play slow. Hmm. To make it stick, I think does. And, you know, Scott is agoraphobic too. I mean, the dude's got riffs for years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's crazy. So I think it may have uh, went off topic a little bit, but did I answer your question? Yeah, you did. You did. I mean, that's kind of the, the point of the show. Like I said to you, I... I, I the conversation goes where the conversation goes, but you, you mentioned you you felt like Head Cage was you know wasn't a very cohesive record. I I must confess it, it's it's probably one of my favorite Big Destroyer records, and I, I I suspect it's got more to do with the time that I really got into it at you know which was just you know very a good time in my life. I was you know I just met my my girlfriend that I'm with now, and you know we we're on holiday. The first literally the first time I listened to it was in the car. I was like new new Big Destroyer is out today. I want to check this out while we're driving, uh, while we were going on holiday. And uh, yeah, so it's it's got it's got good memories, but I do, I, I all of those parts that I like, like you know that I mentioned to you before, you know, it, it, the album is loaded with that. So so what was your your thoughts on the response that you guys had to Head Cage, um, you know, and 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 you know how do you feel about it, you know, three years later? So, uh, obviously, aside from the comment that you made about the the, the lack of cohesion. Well, um, you know, this is. Uh... I think pretty pretentious to say, but it's actually true in our case. We don't make records for anyone but us. Uh, so as long as we're happy with it, that's what matters. Uh, we could put out Prowl in the Yard Part 3 or Terrifier Part 2, but that wouldn't scratch our itch. Um, and, you know, as far as the response goes, it was very divisive at first. Uh, you know, with the internet and modern uh, culture, I think your last record is your worst, no matter who you are. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that being said, the people that were defending it then really defended it. Uh, and after, like you said, three years later, a lot more people seem to be getting into it. Um, I mean, the same thing happened with Book Burner. The same thing happened with uh, Phantom Limb. You know, each of our records sounds different than yeah. the, the one previous so you know like book burner is kind of more of the punk record family is more of the thrash record head cage is kind of the groovier one i would say terrifier is kind of the artier one uh prowler is more of the death metal influence so you know we don't really care i mean we put out the music for us um and as long as we feel strong about the material uh we're good uh so you know i typically don't go back and listen to our stuff after it's done uh with the exception and i'll say this prowler because we're doing it in its entirety so from start to finish i gotta have my parts down and like auto you know like just not even think about what i'm doing so uh you know when i'm in the gym which hasn't been in a year obviously <laughs> uh i just jam that non-stop uh but yeah i don't so like ask my opinion on it you know, I think it's a great record, but I don't, I haven't listened to it probably since I played it for my girlfriend once it was done. Yeah. 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 You well, know, I'll listen. To, if we got to uh, like learn a song, I'll, I'll jam it a bunch, but the records as a whole. Uh, but, you know, like going back and listening to Prowler, I'm just like, man, this is fucking genius. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask you, what, what is the experience like for you playing live? Cause I mean, you're not, you, 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 you're you're doing a bunch of different things, but you're not necessarily you know as kind of constantly involved, say as as Scott, right? That's so, correct. So 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 what is the what is the stage experience like for you? 
And that's a very good way to put it. I mean, I've definitely had interviews where like, well, you don't do shit on stage. I'm like, well, that's, that's debatable. Yeah. Um, I don't know, man. I just like, you know, before I was in Pick Story, I was a huge fan. I known them uh, forever. I booked their like third show. Um, they played with my old band. Uh, there may be like 10 picture shows I've, met, I've been to before I was in the band. Um, so, you know, it's for me, it's just like an absolute release. Like I do get a little jittery beforehand. Uh, and anyone that says they don't is either Prince, David Bowie or Lyme. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, you know, and then it's just like an absolute release. You know, there's times where, especially we do a lot of fly-ins where we'll be in the UK for two days. So trying to get my energy up the second night is tough because I'm jet lagged and hungover and travel, but you know, we try never to force anything. I don't want to be Dillinger escape plan where you have to go nuts. Mm. Um, you know, it's just kind of what happens. Like, uh, once we got Adam, I feel that JR has a lot more energy because of Adam's playing style. Uh, and he used to just kind of stand really still and not face the audience. Uh, now JR goes nuts, but not, he's not Jake from Converge, but that's not what he wants to do or what he should be doing, you know? Yeah. And by the way, just as a, as a again, another side note, Dillinger Escape Plan Live is a fucking trip. I, I yeah. do not know how those guys managed to play a single note in with the precision that they do, given what they do in the stage. And I, I'd always heard it from people. And until you see it happen, it's like, oh my fuck. Uh, I, this, is, this isn't human. I mean, love them or hate them, you got to give them that credit. But like you said, I mean, I saw them in a club in Baltimore that held like 70 people and was like, what in the fuck is going on? Like, yeah. I just didn't. I heard that, you know, this was years ago. Uh, probably like right after Under the Running Board came out and uh, people were like, this band goes nuts. I'm like, yeah, 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 we'll see. I've, I've heard that. <laughs> and like, was just like floored. Yeah, no, it's insane. I, I do think Greg is a phenomenal front man as well. Dude, uh, and now, I'm... yeah. Greg's from like, I lived in Baltimore for 20 years and Greg's from just right outside. Yeah. And uh, didn't really know him until uh, we played some shows with Dillinger and At The Gates in Japan. First At The Gates shows back. Speaking of At The Gates, have you heard the new At The Gates single? I did. Thoughts? I think it's good, man. Uh, it, it seems a click or two too slow to me, but Sorry, Tomas. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I mean, I love At The Gates, and uh, I even like the last one was, what, To Drink From The Night Itself. I like mm -hmm. that one a lot. Um, and I like the new single. Uh, I have high hopes for the record. I think the new, the last record, they didn't miss a beat. Yeah. Um, it just, you know, I'm still that punk rock kid that wants everything at fifth gear and floor to the floor. But, you know, I definitely get maturing and, you know, like I saw Coroner, they're one of my favorite thrash bands at Maryland Death Fest a couple of years ago, and they were so slow and it was so disappointing. But they were tight as a drum. Yeah, yeah. It's like you know, I want, you know, I want my hair to be pushed back. You know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What's left of it anyway? On, on on the punk side, have you you have undoubtedly seen Disfear, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. How cool is Tomas in in Disfear? Just like it's I mean, it's he's in a lot of different bands and he's great in all of them, but. He's such a badass on stage with that band. It, it's I mean, like Tomas, he just he, he becomes like a different person. Tomas to me is uh, first of all, he's just an all around great dude. Yeah. But uh, you know, it, it's weird to me when people say that I'm not a punk rocker because I don't have spikes and a leather jacket. And like to me, grindcore was the next progression of that a punk. Um, and you know, Tomas is like me. Uh, it's extreme music, extreme music, no matter what. Uh, so if it was fast and obnoxious or slightly different, it was all in the same category. It didn't matter to me if it was Swedish death metal or California punk or yeah. straight edge hardcore, <laughs> like, you know? So I feel like this fear is just where Tomas gets to stretch those, those wings a little bit, you know? Well, I think also there's, there's a big punk influence in, in a lot of extreme music, you know, oh, 100%. Black and death metal, um, you know, which uh, I think is very often overlooked. I agree. Um, you know, even in early thrash in, you know, the big 
thrash bands, by the time they got their fourth and fifth records, they kind of slowed down and got boring to me. Yeah. Um, you know, kind of pointing a finger specifically at Testament here. Uh, oh, not Testament, know, mate. I mean, I love the first couple. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Like even some of the later stuff, I think The Gathering is a really solid record. Yeah, um, I agree. But I feel like, you know, you just kind of get stuck in this mold and you kind of repeat yourself. But that's also a product of the industry where they're just like tour, record, tour, record, tour, record, go on the road. Um, so, you know, if you don't have time to develop and work on ideas, then it's not going to be fresh. Uh, but, you know, like I heard of Bad Religion because Mila from Creator was wearing a Bad Religion shirt. And I was like, wow, that's a really cool logo. And I found a Bad Religion cassette like two days later and bought it and loved it. I don't know if I ever would have heard of that. You know, Sepultura rocking Dead Kennedy shirts was was awesome because I was the only kid in high school that liked Dead Kennedys and one of five that liked Sepultura, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I got into Dead Kennedys because Jeff Hanneman had the, uh, obviously had the sticker on his guitar. Yeah. Um, you know, that was, that was the catalyst for me. I've kind of moved away from a lot of that type of stuff. Um, I, when I was in high school, I was into it a lot. I think a lot of the, what I like now, as far as like that, era of music is concerned is more um like minor threat i think is brilliant um you know uh, bad brains is awesome uh i like really early misfits um there's a couple especially on the like the the, the uh, on static age and stuff like that there's a couple of real uh, un- underrated gems in the oh, misfits yeah. back catalog like way away from the, the the you know the famous stuff like she and things like that. There's one song in particular called Comeback, which is quite slow, but fucking hell, it's oh brilliant. dude, Comeback is awesome. I, I yeah. love the Misfits. In fact, I got into them because of Metallica, and yeah. uh, you know I grew up in very rural Maryland, um, like almost in a cornfield, and uh, I found Misfit stuff, and I just thought they were a shitty metal band that couldn't play. Yeah, uh, but I loved it. You know, I didn't have a lot of friends that like punk um you know i went to go see gorilla biscuits uh when i was 13 because i had older friends that were into skateboarding and took me in the famous picture on the back of the start today cover i was at that show that was a safari club in dc but i had no idea what i was seeing um i just kind of hopped in the car with my friends yeah you know so uh i mean my favorite mistress is earth ad but i love all of it until danzig leaves (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I agree. I, I completely agree. Are you a Sam Hain fan? Oh my God, yes. Um, I have everything uh, they've done. Uh, I've Unholy Passion signed by Glenn. It's like, I have no idea what that's worth these days. Uh, I know London May. Um, a buddy of mine knows Steve Zing. I'm a huge Sam Hain fan. Yeah, that, that was another that that's another band I, I feel doesn't get spoken of enough and kind of in a way i like it i like it like that <laughs> I, yeah. I want it to, to remain the, the 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 treasure that it is but so the, they did some reunion shows a couple of years ago around halloween and they offered us the tour and it was only like three or four days which is about what we can do because of obligations and i pushed so hard to do it i don't even think the money was there and i think the band was ready to give in just for me uh and yeah. uh i don't remember what happened but they got goat whore instead and i'm like well that's cool man i love goat whore and i love those dudes and they're more of like a quote-unquote scary band than we are you know yeah like our songs aren't about horror stuff or traditional like metal stuff hey i gotta get some ice real quick uh so no, 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 no worries, man. In case you gotta edit this out. <laughs> no, 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 I don't mind. Um, I, I was gonna say shout out to Glenn because you know I know that he asks for for bands by name to to you know to come on tour and you know you know he'll always take out like a band like Marduk or you know he'll Is take that- out something heavy or he'll take a, he'll always take out something badass uh, when he goes on tour. Um, you know, and I I I. I really respect and appreciate that. I think, you know, like the, the big four as, as an example, will very, very rarely give like a, a small, a smaller band a, a chance, which is why I well, thought it was so cool that Slayer had obituary out with them as an example. And yeah, and I mean, Metallica took the sword out and Metallica took out Baroness. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I think that those bands are pretty big for the underground, but you know, when you're the biggest rock band on the planet, and as much as I'm not a fan of Pantera, I mean, they took out Morbid Angel back in the 90s. Yeah, yeah. But uh, going back to Glenn Danzig, when will these old punk rock dudes learn to shut their fucking mouths about cancel culture and Trump and fucking 
John Lydon from the Sex Pistols? Get the fuck out of here. Yeah, yeah. I, saw, I saw that. <laughs> the most world-renowned punk band, punk with a capital P. And you're yeah. like a conservative Trumper? Like, get the fuck out. Yeah, Just shut yeah. your mouth. <laughs> I mean, Glenn, I, I, I've, I've spoken about this before, but I, I, I interviewed him uh, and ended up talking to him for, for quite a long time and, and thought he was a really cool guy. And I, and I know it's very much flies against modern, <laughs> not modern convention, but, you know, like uh, pop, popular sentiment about him. You know, a lot of people had met him prior to me speaking to him and they didn't like him, but I, I got on great with him. I thought he was a fucking cool dude. I bet he's cool, but like, unless you're Jelly Biafra, or like Ian Mackay, I don't really want to hear your opinion on modern culture. You write B fifties horror songs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know? no, that's fair enough. Like we don't write political music, so when we get asked in interviews, I tend to shy away from that. Like it's a very hard thing in America right now to not speak about it, but it's not related to our music. You know, yeah. obviously we're not racist and not homophobic, not transphobic and for rights for all people, but that's all I feel like we really need to say. Our lyrics aren't, our music isn't designed for politics. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, I mean, I, I you know, again, I, I wrestle with this because there's a lot of bands that I like that are very political and, you know, a lot of the, uh, their views I might agree with some, I might not. Um, but I, I, I do feel like in the current climate that we're in, I think it's necessary for, for a lot of art to be, or at least some art to be apolitical, because I, you know, if I think about, you know, all of my best friends, all of my best friends I, I met because we shared, you know, a couple of interests in common, and invariably most of it's music. So my best friend, for example, met him because I got a random call from somebody one day um, on my fifteenth birthday saying, "Hey, I, I heard you're looking for a copy of the first Dear Side album. I've got it. I'll sell it to you if uh, if you want it." And you know, we just hit it off, became friends straight away. And, and we needed nothing more than that shared interest in music to to become friends. I feel like the more partisan or openly partisan a band becomes when it when it comes to their views, and it's their right to do so if they want to, but the more partisan arts become, the more divisive it gets. And that really should be the thing that 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 brings people together and goes, hey, actually, maybe we've got a few differences of opinion, but we also have a lot that we, we share in common. I mean, I agree with you to a certain extent. You know, um, the protest last year, they weren't just in America, they were global. And, you know, that's like the protest uh, against racism in the 60s, but that was mostly based in America. Yeah. You know, we got a lot of shit uh, on our social medias for me posting a Black Lives Matter thing, which just means we're anti-racist. And to me, if I lose a fan because of that, I'm fine with that. But I'm not preaching. I'm not yeah. talking about something that I'm not super educated about. Uh, I don't know the ins and outs of politics. I'm not super interested in it. So I'm not, I tend to shy away because I don't want to say something that's, uh, you know, fake news or misleading or just wrong. Mm. Um, so I, I do agree. But, you know, if I'm asked about our band and like, you know, my, uh, I have a relative that's trans, uh, you know, you're roughly my age being gay is not a big deal anymore. Like it used to be in the eighties and the nineties, yeah. you know, it, it's to me and, and growing up and being part of the punk punk culture, it's disturbing to me when I feel like I'm being preached to by someone that's a peer that, you know, I, I feel I'm educated. So I already know these things are wrong. I know corporations, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. I know yeah, yeah. globalization is not really my thing. Um, yeah. so, you know, I, I know that I'm anti organized religion. Uh, I really feel like I'm being talked down to by a lot of punk bands when they do that sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, it's not the eighties where you're bringing awareness to these sort of things anymore. Uh, I feel that there's ways to go about it, fundraising and benefits and stuff like that. That's how you can get involved. But I feel like a lot of stuff is super preachy. And like you said, it's very partisan, Yeah, you know? I personally am not a big fan of Trump and his supporters, but if someone wants to come to our shows, doesn't cause problems and they like Trump, then I'm cool with that. Yeah. It's, it's not a platform for them to get all QAnon. But. Well, this is the thing too, though, you know, it's, it's, it's a scale, you know, and I think that, that, that is often overlooked. I mean, there's a, there's a scale from, you know, being a conservative voter to, to QAnon. There's also a scale from being a, you know, a, a Democrat voter to being, you know, an Antifa. 
Right. Uh, and I think a lot of times that, you know, I feel like with this this cult of personality that we have in the modern world, I think that gets missed. Uh, and I think it's a very, very dangerous thing because it, it's, you know, it, it it's not as clear cut as in I'm in one camp or I'm in the other. There's there's an awful lot of people, and and I and I follow this very closely, so I, I see it I see it a lot. There's an awful lot of people in America that feel politically homeless. Um, you know, and there's yeah. a ton of people that were, you know, as an example, were you know you know open open Democrats. You know, used to fundraise for the Democrats. You know, were very strongly on the left. Still consider themselves classical liberals, but in the last election, they voted for Trump, and they 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 said it's it's the it's you know, they don't agree with either side, but I agree on this side more than I agree with this side. I mean, to um, me, it's uh, it's more of it in this specific case, uh, a, a, an issue of misinformation and misleading. Um, I really think that as ineffectual as I'm not a huge Biden fan, but I feel like he's trying. Uh, I feel that Trump didn't and just lies and says, well, I did this. Like he said, he won the election, but you didn't. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> You know, and that's, it, it, it's more of a cult than it was. And it's very divisive. And, you know, I always thought that Europeans laugh at Americans for this because that shit's been going on in Europe for years. <laughs> like, yeah, no, you yeah. know, if you're a political leader in Europe gets busted with a prostitute, everyone's like, yeah, big deal. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. like, hello, Italy. Like, well, you know. I was just about to say, wasn't, wasn't the, the Italian prime minister, he, like the, the storied accounts of him having three ways and being with prostitutes every single day. Right. But does that really affect his ability to lead? I don't know. I'm not involved in Italian politics and won't speak to that, but like, I don't really, you know, to me, uh, sex work should be legal. <laughs> so yeah, I agree. You know, it's like, it's not shocking to me. It's, yeah, you know, yeah. Just because you're a basketball player or a rock star or a, a political leader doesn't mean you should be held to a higher standard than everyone else. But I feel like transparency is a big thing. Yeah, yeah. But you I, I, can't I, I, run on a platform and be like, hey, I go to horse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the person that would have been able to come close to getting away with that is it's probably Trump, <laughs> yeah. but I, I, I think you, you hit uh, on, a, on a very good point earlier though, is about, I think particularly people, people our age. And I, I, I agree with you is, is when I feel like I'm being preached to from either side, it's like, look, man, you know, you're not in any way qualified to tell me what to do, what to think, how to live my life. Um, and, and it's, and it's, and it's, again, it's, it's that fine line between having an opinion and, and, and talking down to people. Um, and uh, I think that, that definitely for me, that's what causes a lot of the divisiveness. I mean, I, I respect somebody like Dana White from the UFC that just turned around and said, if you want to see anything political, people can say what they want. You know, the fighters can stand for what they want. They can, you know, push anything that they want. But I, we're not talking about politics on, on, on any of our um, shows or anything like that. You and come here to watch fights and that's it. And that's a little different as, you know, especially underground extreme music is a form of art. So, you know, there's a band from New Jersey that I love that's super pro trans rights. They're called Sun Rock. And they're amazing sludge man. Mm. Uh, you know, like I said, I have a trans relative personally that love that bothers me, but I know it turns a lot of people off. But that's also their decision. They're very transparent about it. It's not like you're going to walk into that show and be unaware, be taken by surprise if you're anti trans. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, but, and you probably wouldn't be welcome there. But, you know, it, it's that sort of thing. Um, yeah, they're very verbal and outspoken about it. Uh, I'm not a fan of racism and I think it should be obliterated, but if you're a racist band, don't try to couch it. Just be like, this is what we believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's your right to say it, although I don't support it. And then, you know, hence I wouldn't support by going to a show or giving you any money. But, you know, I also am a firm believer in you can change the channel or you can vote with your wallet. Yeah. I, I, and again, I agree with that. And, and, and equally, I, I do believe that um, you can, generally speaking, the majority of people can expose bad ideas in the court of public opinion. I mean, racism, Absolutely. anyone with, with half a brain knows that it's fucking moronic. I mean, I, I mean I, what's I, going on in America? They're like trying to change voting laws and it's not even subtle. <laughs> it's yeah. like, you know, just be like, we don't want black and brown people to vote. So we can get you out of office and just say it. <laughs> like that's what yeah. you want but that's also the thing the, the, the thing with the american political system i think it's 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 worse in america than it is in a lot of other places it it, it it's definitely uh, present but i feel like 
party politics comes in comes in uh, in the way of principle an awful lot on both sides. I agree, one hundred percent, and which is why America needs a third party. Yeah, badly. But yeah, yeah. partisan politics is the worst. It's you know you can be conservative and still vote for whoever you think. That's the whole point of the American system. But it's not working these days. No, I agree, and I, and I think if anybody is, has got an opportunity to create a viable third party, it would be someone like uh, Tulsi Gabbard. Um, yeah, but, um, or yeah, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Yeah, but she's very uh, left. I was about to say but... she couldn't. She'll start the Communist Party, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Now, see, I, I would, my my personal view is I'm a I'm very much a stay out of my life, stay out of my pocket. Uh, I, I have that view of of, of government. You know, what, so, what was it that Churchill said that democracy is the worst form of government except for every other one? Yeah, yeah, that's true <laughs> as well. But I think I think Tulsi is a good is a good uh, middle ground, um, and she's well spoken, and she's got. I think she she recognizes a, a, a need for people to come together based on what they have in common rather than going, right, this is what we what, what we differ about, so fuck you. <laughs> you know, you know? Yeah, currently it's about the individual, not the greater whole. Yes, I agree. Which is a shame. Or it's about corporations and not the greater whole. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah and again, you know, uh, what, what, another thing that I, I, I can't stand, we, you were talking about artists and, you know, musicians and, and sports stars and stuff like that preaching to you. I mean, when corporations start preaching to you, you know, Nike is telling you how to live your life, but it's like, well, you you know, how much business do you guys do in China? And, and you know, do we want to get into the, the details of human rights abuses in China? You, you know, who the fuck are you to tell me what to do? That, that sort of thing really, really, really works my nerves. Yeah, I, I, I try to stay away from Amazon. You know, uh, we have Uber here and the prices just went up like crazy. And they just, there's commercials now saying donate rides, that the individual should donate rides for people to get vaccinated. I'm like, dude, you're a multi-billion corporation. You donate the ride. Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? You just charged me $40 to go three miles, which is absurd. Why am I going to give you more money for you to write off on your taxes? Yeah, but again, well, I find it so frustrating when I see how easily led people are. You know, if you if you look at if you look at corporations as an example, is you know historically the things that corporations have come out and supported over the over the years, they 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 go where the wind blows. You know, they they people don't realize there's a marketing department sitting in that corporation going, you know, what's really in vogue at the moment? This Black Lives Matters business. Let's let's really let's hit on that. It's like guys, they don't believe a fucking thing that they're saying. They, they say that. what they're saying to to get you to buy their stuff. I mean, you know, prime prime example. Every single uh, piece of um, content with gay connotations or anything like that on Netflix in Saudi Arabia gone. None of that. Right. So if they if they were generally or genuinely as open and inclusive as principled as they were, do people think that that would actually happen? Would they do that? No. Well, in, it's up to the consumer to decide, but uh, yeah. I did want to comment. I like your stodgy British impersonation of, <laughs> of uh, you know, you're like, it's almost like you're a barrister. <laughs> oh, dude, I'll tell you a story in a second, but, 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 but carry uh, on. But I have a, a point to that. There was my buddy Jason from Misery Index is in town, and we were talking about uh, old school death metal in particular. And now some of the bigger labels are starting to snap up some of these small bands. Um, and I'm not going to point fingers, but I was like, does this mean that that scene is kind of going to die down? And he was like, yes, most definitely. When the bigger labels try to do it and they realize, I mean, it was just like punk. It changes the, the tone of the scene when someone tries to monetize it that much and make a bunch of money and it doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, you know, like I love the band Sagrisa Gabob. I think I'm saying that right. And I uh, reviewed their new record and people were already talking shit because it's on Nuclear Blast or Century Media. I don't remember which one. I'm like, it's a good record, though. But what does it matter what label they are on? Mm. To me, it doesn't. Yeah, but that's, again, I think that's an age thing. I, you know, I think you and I have the same view. I don't give a shit. They could be signed to fucking Sony for all I care. If I like the music, I like the music. Exactly. But, dude, so you, you, oh, you, you, you mentioned Barrist. I have to tell you this. So I, I was about... This must have been about 12, 13 years ago. I did uh, jury service in the UK. That was my first experience of the... Fortunately, I haven't had any first, first-hand experience of the, this of the United Kingdom legal system. But anyway, they, they had set aside two days to bring to justice the scourge of... Um, I think it was Kew Gardens Retail Park, this woman named Jeanette, 
and she had stolen 60 pounds worth of baby clothing for which we spent two exhaustive days going through like how high, how tall was the gondola when you were you know for the security guard how tall was the gondola you were standing behind as Jeanette fled the scene blah 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 so finally on this on the second day the uh the the what's the name the barrister calls out his uh you know his star witness Jeanette she comes on before she's even you know been sworn in she looks at the at the jury she goes I didn't do nothing I always confess to my crimes <laughs> And also how much taxpayer money was wasted on that exactly. trial for 60 pounds. The, the, the best part of it is this, this the earnestness with which the barrister in his closing summation uh, says to us, you heard Jeanette say, I didn't do nothing. I always confess to my crimes. I burst out laughing to a point where the, the, the judge actually like looked at me. I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to be fucking hell for contempt. What we do with criminals is ship them off to Australia. <laughs> he should have said, like, Jeanette, off to Australia with you. No, fucking hell. But yeah, I, I had that, and then uh, I, I had another case, but that was a funny one. <laughs> Do they still wear the wigs? Uh, no, no. Oh, bummer. No, they don't. But this was uh, county court, so it might have been in like uh, in, in in you know you know in a, in a more serious thing. They might still might still break out the wigs. It definitely wasn't. Um, I've been trying to think what uh, what what legal TV show or it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't the court on Ali McBeal that's for sure. Right. Well, I mean, it's the same thing. I was watching uh, something from the eighties, and like you know, the, there was a scene shot in New York, and there's like people sleeping in the gutter and newspaper going down the street. And granted, New York was a lot more dangerous than it was fucked up, but it's like, yeah, that's what I thought New York was when I was growing up. Yeah. Before well, New York was dangerous in the in the eighties. It was, uh, but it wasn't then, uh, quite every you know a wino being like, "Give me a drink, man." <laughs> De Blasio came in and he decided, "I want to, I want to go back to the glory days." <laughs> <laughs> well, look, uh, what's his face is in big trouble right now. He changed New York, made into Disneyland, and now he's getting arrested. Cuomo, Giuliani. Oh, Giuliani, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Qu- Cuomo is in trouble as well because. Oh, yeah. um, he stuck a bunch of old people in the uh, in the home during uh, you know that, that that had COVID. So and again, lied about it. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, if you if you hear some of the stories now, a lot of these stories I always think is like really exa- it's like super exaggerated. But you know, the stuff that he he apparently there was uh, this Democrat guy that went. I, think, I can't remember what news channel he was on. But he was giving his recount of uh, of Cuomo calling him the night before and threatening him, and he's like, "I will end you." <laughs> And he's yep, like, not- the Cuomo's are known as the mafia politicians of New York City. Yep, it's not the 60s anymore, dude. <laughs> yeah, big time. Um, that, so, dude, picking that up, by the way, my dog is like right by me making a bunch oh, don't of worry. I don't worry. I have one as well who, uh, okay, you, you, every now and then you, you, you hear her ears flapping in the, <laughs> in the, in the microphone. Well, let so me know what- if it picks it up. No, don't worry about that, man. So, what is the uh, so so? What's the plans for you guys now? You mentioned you're busy writing. Have you got a, a an idea of when you might release something? Are you waiting for you know COVID to lift properly so you can do shows? Or well, what's we the plan? haven't all been in the same room. Um, we're we're working on our vaccination, so that will be soon. Uh, Misery Index, which Adam is still in a part of, uh, is recording soon. So we're kind of writing now. Uh, with the plan on practicing for the couple shows we have coming up uh, if they happen and then starting to like really tighten up the new material and then record. So no, we we have no plan. I mean, usually it's five to six years for us. Um, uh, Mostly because Scott flip-flops between Pick Destroyer and Agoraphobic, but I don't think he is this time. Uh, Just other stuff. I mean, COVID put a damper on everybody's life. So yeah uh, and that's true i was going to ask you i mean you guys weren't exactly a hard touring band but do you miss it do you miss not being able to play live oh, absolutely 100 percent, man i love it yeah. uh i mean i will fly to europe play two shows and get off the plane and go into the office yeah you know and at 45 that's not easy but i'll do it it's you know it's not my job and it's not the money it's i do it for the love of it. all of us do I mean, why else would I fly to Europe to play 40 minutes with the music? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, uh, we, 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 which is very true. I was going to ask you, does, does anybody at the office know of your uh, 
of your moonlighting in a uh... yeah it's just me and my boss so yeah he knows um yeah what does he uh, think he loves it man he's an old rock dude uh you know used to own a club in in philly or jersey i, I don't remember years and years ago so he thinks it's pretty cool and you know as long as i get my work done it's kind of like whatever <laughs> yeah yeah brother i want to thank you very much for your time uh it's been an absolute blast talking to you and uh you know i hope very much hope that we uh we bump into each other at some point in the uk when yeah uh, i mean we're over. right now we're still playing on damnation which is good because the last time we played we were really shitty so i'd like to uh, <laughs> yeah and damnation like to, is uh it's november right yes um and hopefully i can talk to longer deaf guys into coming out yeah uh, well the uh the Acrococca guys are going to be at Damnation doing uh, Go to Mendes in its entirety as well. Very cool. Yeah, which I don't know if you're a fan of Acrococca, but I'm oh yes, guy. of course, dude, such a fucking big fan, I, and and that is one of my favorite albums of all time. So criminally underrated band. I, I completely agree, and I I don't understand why they never got their their just desserts because especially you know especially now that people can you know have more access to music and get a, get hold of them more easily. I mean, they are fucking brilliant brilliant I agree. I agree but uh yeah i mean i dude i i will i will i'm definitely going to try and get to damnation so uh you know hopefully we uh i mean we'll, we'll stay in touch anyway but hopefully we can see each other there yeah and send me the stuff we talked about and then when you're uh ready to release this send this and you know it's, yeah so this will go the, this will go up on tuesday um so from okay we're, from we're doing this will go up just tuesday. hit me up and i'll share it on our socials i'll send it to relapse so awesome all right dude hang fire Thank you so much to Blake for coming on to the show. You just heard a track called Army of Cops off of Headcage, which Pig Destroyer put out back in 2018 on Relapse. Um, go check it out if you've uh, if you've not done so yet. I do feel like that record um, got the bum end of the stick when it first came out. Um, and I don't really know why, because um, frankly, I mean, I've been a Pig Destroyer fan since way, way, way back. Um, and uh, this to me is one of, uh, one of my favorites. Uh, I think it's very consistent. Uh, I think it's an album that, um, you know, is, is maybe a little more song orientated than some of just the crazy blasting that you heard on an album like Prowler in the Yard. Um, but uh, yeah, really enjoyed it. And I really enjoyed having Blake on the show. Um, it's one of those guys where basically as soon as we started talking, I felt like uh, like there was a, a good synergy and a good connection there and hence why the conversation flowed as easily as it did. So hopefully uh, he will be back on the show at some point in the not too distant future. Let us talk now about some new music, and Paradigma is the title of the new Inferno record. Inferno, of course, uh, hailing from Chechia. They have been around since 1996, and they have recorded seven full lengths, not including their latest to date. Uh, they also put out a ton of splits, EPs. Whatever had come previously, I think, was... Um, was probably not particularly indicative of what they have managed to put together on uh, on this album. I mean, noteworthy releases from their back catalog to me would include things like um, uh, Black Devotion, which came out in 2009. Uh, their 2017 record, um, the name of which escapes me now, uh, I think is also worth checking out. Um, but whatever has, uh, whatever Debu Murmorti, their new record label, has slipped into their into their drinks, uh, clearly has uh, has borne fruit because this is an album that is more ambitious, uh, more experimental, but at the same time more focused than I think anything that they that they have ever done before. And I think if I had to do opt for the lazy way to describe it, I would uh, reference things like the discordant malevolence that you hear on a record like Auto Art Keo by Mayhem, uh, as well as that really sort of grandiose wall of sound, dark psychedelia um, that came off of uh, Exuvia by Ruins of Everest. Again, if you, if you know me and you know this podcast, uh, then you know that I enjoy both of those records. So, you know, from my perspective, that is a huge compliment. I also feel like some of the really kind of off-the-wall avant-garde uh, experimentation of uh, Oranzi Pazuzu uh, or Ranzi Pazuzu's last record, I should say, may have influenced this record to a degree. All of that is there, but uh, you know, at the same time, Inferno definitely sound like um, like their own band. They sound like their own sound, more so, I think, than they've ever done in their in their career to date. Um, and the results are, are absolutely spectacular. The record is uh, about thirty six minutes long. I don't think it it has a single point where it's not 
extraordinarily good. Um, you know, the, it's 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 very much one of those records that you have to enjoy in a single sitting because you know it feels like a journey from start to finish. My only complaint about the journey is that it's over way too soon. I mentioned the album is thirty six minutes long, and and this album to me, in a way, it almost feels like the length of the record undermines the significance of what uh, what the band have put together here. And and you can argue that you know it's a, it's a good thing to finish on a high. Um, you know, but but this feels to me like it it had the potential to be an epic one hour record. Either way, you know, for the thirty six minutes that it's there, it is fantastic, and it's something that I think um, you know you will like myself probably return to time and time again. Um, I I believe I've mentioned this on uh, social media as well, but you know, ultimately, I think it's going to take an absolutely titanic effort for any band to unseat this from my number one spot for uh, for twenty twenty one. Uh, it, it really is that good. And kudos to Debo Mamorti for, um, you know, picking these guys out. They seem to have a knack for, uh, you know, for spotting great talent, um, you know, and, and either bringing them back from obscurity or just giving them a platform to, you know, to, to put out some of their best work, as most certainly has been the case here. Um, so uh, I will pause right there and uh, and lay a track off of Paradigma on you right now. This is one of my favorites of the album. It's called Ecstasis in Continuum.
That was Extasis in Continuum by Inferno off a record called Paradigma. It's available on Debo Morty right now, so go check it out. Head to Bandcamp, buy yourself some merch, buy yourself some music, um, and when they ask you who sent you, let them know that it was old Jackson at Into the Necrosphere. I actually did uh, connect with Thomas, um, the uh, the vocalist for uh, for this band, so uh, I'm hopefully going to have him on the show at some point. Uh, he has in- in- intimated that he is interested, so um, I'm hoping to have him on the show to talk a bit more about some of the concepts behind this, because um, just some of the posts that he puts up on Facebook uh, is already um, you know pretty interesting, and and frankly I have to confess beyond my intelligence levels. So <laughs> um, I'm uh, I'm curious to understand more of the more of the thinking and more of the writings that inspired this, but um, I, I cannot stress enough how much I enjoyed this so i hope you guys like that track too it kind of has um a a slight vibe similar to the cover that satiricon did of orgasmatron where it, it's got that really kind of militant black metal sound to it um you know and another thing that i i thought about when i when i heard this record for the first time way way back when uh, you know i was still ordering my music through the nuclear blast catalog you know trying to decipher what was cool amongst all the german writing which i didn't didn't understand uh, one of the one of the sure marks of quality was when they would describe a record and they would you know have the German description in there and right at the end in capitals with about fifty exclamations after that total war <laughs> and uh, yeah I definitely think the new Inferno is total war so take that for what it's worth uh, and like I said do check out the record time now for some news and uh, we will start on Metal Storm as per usual the first headline reads. Gloria Belly drop new video. Um, Gloria Belly are a band that I feel had the potential to be one of the coolest black metal bands on the planet. If you go back and listen to their third record, um, which came out in 2009 on Candlelight, it's called Meet Us at the Southern Sign. Um, if I'm in a good mood, I might play uh, one of the tracks uh, at the end of the video or at the end of the show. But um, fantastic album, absolutely flawless in my opinion. And after that, they just seem to kind of... They never really seem to be able to find their feet again, um, you know. And, and I must admit, frankly, when you release a, a a video for an album that came out back in 2018, in you know three years later, I, I I'm not sure that um, you're uh, you're necessarily on the right path. And and you know also I've checked out the video. I listened uh, or I re-listened recently to this album. It's called The Apostates. It came out in 2018, um, and uh, the song. It's called Rebel uh, Reveries. Um, it's just not very good, um, especially not considering the standard that those guys set um, on Meet Us at the Southern Sign. Do check out that album, though. It is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and, uh, yeah, like I said, a, a um, an, an indication of the, the, band's, um, the band's potential, which uh, sadly never came to fruition. Uh, the next um, headline, Ancient Wisdom streaming upcoming albums opening track uh, after recently confirming the release of his first full-length album in 17 years, a one-man project, Ancient Wisdom now premiere the opening track, Haik Est Mor Secunda, a celebration in honor of death album will hit the streets on June 4th. Um, I checked this out, um, not a bad song. Um, I've uh, I've not really spent a whole lot of time with uh, anything in the Ancient Wisdom back catalog. This kind of sounded a little bit to me like um, Batushka in that you've got these, you know, almost kind of Gregorian chants with black metal as the uh, as the soundtrack. But uh, yeah, in, in, in interesting enough, certainly enough to make me want to check out the uh, the rest of the album. So I will put that down on the list. Uh, you know, and like I've said, I, I really do think, and you know, Inferno for me is is very much the kickstart of that. This the second half of this year is going to be very, very, very cool indeed. Um, there's a whole bunch of bands that have been sitting on projects, or you know, have been uh, you know working on projects for a while now, and I think all of those are going to be released, and I think we're going to be surprised by what all comes out. Although, like I said, it's going to take some doing to unseat Inferno from their um, from their top spot. Um, Parallax Occlusion, um, who some of you may know from their uh, prestigious spot um, in the uh, Into the Necrosphere Demo of the Week Hall of Fame, uh, are about to release a new demo. The article reads, On the heels of December 2020's first demo, Exponential Decay, which was featured on Into the Necrosphere and means that ultimately Parallax Occlusion have now attained the highest station possible in the music industry. Uh, Parallax Occlusion from Ontario, Canada present a more dynamic, more expansive and even heavier three-song second demo, Ray Traces of Death. 
It will be released on June 21st through Debo Murmorty Productions, which I find interesting because, um, I mean, firstly, again, kudos to Debo Murmorty. They have uncovered yet another great band. Um, I would like to think perhaps this uh, this podcast had something to do with it, but um, who knows? I'll uh, that may be one where I just fool myself into uh, into thinking so to make myself feel good. Uh, but either way, you know, and they've uncovered this band, which is great. The track "Incalculable Threshold" serves as a preview of this demo, and can be listened via Bandcamp. Mastermind XT comments, the songs were crafted immediately after our first demo, Exponential Decay, was recorded. We're all super pleased with how everything turned out. I actually think it's heavier than our first demo. The newer elements are skank beats for the first time, as heard in the song Geometric Dismemberment. Cello layers performed by XE on the song Incalculable Thresholds, and even a semi-melodic black metal-inspired outro to the whole demo. Production-wise, it's even heavier, more distorted bass, more chainsaw on the guitars, bigger cymbals and louder vocals. I love that demo, uh, and I think it's, one, I think it's fucking great that uh, Deborah Mawanti are putting out uh, the next one. I hope that uh, they're going to put out a full length at some point in the not-too-distant future. And uh, I will really look forward to, um, I'll really look forward to hearing that demo, or that second demo. Uh, kudos, by the way, to Scott Bamford for um, uh, putting me onto this band, um, because it was him that waved this under my nose and uh, suggested that I share it with the Into the Necrosphere masses. Um and uh, I'm very glad that I did. Um, and also, just a reminder, if you are in an unsigned band and you want me to hear your best work, um, you have sold your mother's um, antique thimble collection to pay for some studio time, then um, drop me a line with a, a link to where I can hear it, or ideally with a download link um, to uh, into the necrosphere at gmail.com. Or you can also hit me up on the socials. And if I like what I hear, I will uh, feature it on the show. And if I really like what I hear, you might even be invited to come on as a guest. Um, Mayhem EP release confirmed. I've been speculating about this for a while, as uh, those that follow this new section or that stick around for this new section will know. Um, it says here, the mighty Mayhem have returned this or will return this summer with a brand new EP release uh, titled Atavistic Black Disorder slash commando the outing contains additional material from the demon sessions including a homage to bands that lay the foundation for what was to come the cover artwork was once again handled by italian designer danielle velarani what velarani i'm not going to bother with that (laughs) who took care of the artwork for their previous long player the ep will be released on july 9th through century media records i always had some punk influences says attila I guess it comes from my childhood where we were constantly looking for more extreme music. That's how I discovered Dead Kennedys, GBH, The Exploited, Sex Pistols, UK Subs, Discharge, Rudimentary Penny, and so on. In the early 80s, alongside heavy metal, but then I discovered Venom, and that was a game changer. Um, So uh, it's an interesting track list here. Seven tracks. Um, There are two that you will already know if you uh, have got the Demon uh, Limited Edition. And and frankly, I believe that the Limited Edition is what they've had on all of the streaming services too because both of those songs are certainly on the the version I listen to on Kobaz. Those songs being Black Glass Communion and Everlasting Dying Flame, both of which are excellent. Uh, There's one track that uh, is unreleased called Voces Up Alter. Um, and then there's four covers. One is In Defense of Our Future by Discharge. Um, another is Hell Nation by Dead Kennedys. Only Death, uh, formerly sung or, or originally performed by Rudimentary Penny. And then Commando, um, which is a Ramones cover. Um, I, uh, I'm excited to hear this, but I, I will say the one thing that I'm missing here is that Burzum cover. Um, you know, and maybe uh, Necro Butcher and Attila and the gang decided that uh it wasn't appropriate to have it uh, to have it on there but i do know that when ghoul was on the show for episode 45 he could neither confirm nor deny the existence of a yeasus dot cover i am um, f- from everything that i know that that was definitely recorded um it would be so cool to hear it um but um, you know again i understand if uh, you know there's you know obviously given the background and the story i completely understand if they if they didn't feel that it was appropriate Either way, uh, glad that they're putting this out. Uh, excited to hear what they do with the Dead Kennedys track. Although I, I do, um, I always find it bizarre when people refer to Dead Kennedys as extreme. You know, you often see on uh, you know hardcore documentaries or you know even like I've I've heard some grind bands talk about you know how Dead Kennedys were so extreme and so heavy, and I just don't see it. I, I don't mind their music, but um, I mean 
you know, extreme. I, I, I don't think so. I think the Minutemen were fucking more extreme than that. Um, okay, next up, Seth. Oncoming full-length effort streaming in full ahead of tomorrow's official release. Black Metalers Seth have decided to premiere their entire new full-length uh, La Morsure du, Cri du Christ. <laughs> A 45-minute long output can be listened via Season of Mist YouTube channel. Um, I did see a couple of emails come my way about Seth, um, but it's not something that I've um, that I've actually listened to. So I will check that out for sure. If it's out in Season of Mist, I'm immediately interested. Um, and speaking of Season of Mist, they are also releasing uh, the new Ophidian Eye. So if you guys remember, uh, I had on uh, the, uh, the the lads from Ophidian Eye um, for uh, for their other band, Halfro. Uh, and I believe this would have been way back on probably episode 27 or 28, um, around, around about there. Uh, great guys, um, and I, you know, I've stayed in touch with them, so hopefully I can get them on to talk about Ophidian Eye. But um, again, the article reads, On July 16th, uh, 2021, Icelandic tech death outfit Ophidian Eye will put their sophomore full-length effort, uh, will put out their sophomore full-length effort titled Desolate. The latter is scheduled for worldwide release through Season of Mist. Below you can stream an official video for the opening track, Diamonds. Um, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll be interested to hear that. As we all know, Tech Death, not my favorite, um, but the Hellfro guys are badasses. Hellfro is a fucking great band. Um, and so uh, I, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll look forward to, to that with a, to listening to that with a keen ear. Let's move on now to Blabbermouth and the big story of the day. So um, some of you may have followed this. Some of you may know what I'm talking about, but basically yesterday uh after i had already recorded everything on this episode only to discover that for some fucking stupid reason my computer had switched my uh or switched from my sure microphone to my um webcam microphone and that the audio was garbage and that i would have to redo everything this story came out so i figured it's probably good timing because uh you know best i talk about this sooner rather than later um, basically, uh, Dave Ellison, uh, into the Necrosphere alumni and uh, Megadeth bassist, um, was uh, was caught um, on video jacking it <laughs> in front of a 19-year-old. Um, and so naturally, the accusations of pedophilia were thrown about. Um, you know, he put out a very defensive statement very, very quickly. The 19-year-old the in question also put out a statement saying that um you know she was uh you know she was a consenting adult nothing inappropriate happened outside of the videos i mean either way it's a it's a very bad look uh you know the guy's been married for 28 years uh, in the first instance i feel for his wife uh and for his two kids who are going to be put through an extraordinary amount of embarrassment and humiliation thanks to this um you know it it the i mean i've seen the videos on youtube and frankly i you know, i'm sad that i cannot unsee them if uh if anyone has uh, access to any of that eternal sunshine of the spotless mind memory erasing shit then let me know um but uh i the the thing that i just don't understand right and i'll, I'll again i'll I'll preface all of this by saying I had a great time talking to David. I know that I uh, that a lot of you guys really enjoyed the uh, the interview as well. He's an exceptionally nice guy, and I've never heard anything different uh, about him. Um, you know, and I, I, you know, one, I massively appreciate the fact that he, you know, took time aside from obviously what we know now. He spends most of his time jerking off, <laughs> jerking off, but uh, you know, took time away from his busy masturbation schedule to uh, to come on the show. But you know. On a, on a serious note, what I what I do not understand is how in this day and age, when there are armies of simps waiting online, frothing at the loins at the opportunity, you know, at, at the very at the very idea or the very whiff of being able to fuck up someone's life and wreck their career and wreck their reputation, why you would why you would put yourself in this sort of situation? Um, you know, you may have thought that the 19-year-old that you were talking to was sweet, innocent, not, well, obviously not innocent, but, you know, was, was, was trustworthy. But all it takes is for her to set, share that video with a friend, and, you know, that friend is unlikely going to, or, or not unlikely, sorry, and is likely going to share it with another friend because you're famous, and then you are going to be fucked, as poor David is now. Um, Megadeth have already released a statement saying that they're um, watching developments closely. So you know that uh, you know his tenure or his second tenure in Megadeth may well be coming to an end soon. 
Um, like I said, I mean, his wife, I'd be very surprised if she doesn't give him the, uh, give him the old heave ho, um, for absolutely nothing. I mean, you know, if he, if he was that desperate to, uh, you know, get his, you know, get some, get some outside nookie, there's other ways to do it, you know, or even better, you can follow the, the Joe Rogan mantra and you can jerk off, then think about it. You know, if after you've blown your load and you're sat in the refractory period and you're still, you still think to yourself, you know, what would be a great idea it's getting on Zoom and, you know, jacking off to for a 19 year old, uh, you know, then go for it. You know, clearly it's a clearly it's a great idea. But I, I cannot possibly see how that would have been the case. And again, I, I don't know anybody semi semi intelligent, in, especially in the culture as, as it is right now, would put themselves in a in a in a potentially compromising position like this. Um, you know, it's just it, it's 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 mind boggling. Uh, I suspect it's uh, you know it's a lesson he's about to learn. Um, you know, the hard way. And and the other thing that I would say is whether you agree with uh, you know with his religious views or not. I mean, one, I, I'm always, I'm always, I, I don't know what the words, like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised, but I, 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 I'm, I'm not surprised, but surprised at the same time. I don't know. I'll, I'll figure out a word for it in a second, but yeah, it never, it, it always seems to be the, 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 you know, the most virtuous, the most pious people that get caught up in this shit. I mean, Andrew Weiner, you know, fuckface politician um, in America who was, uh, you know, the, the, the pinnacle of virtue, um, you know, or held up as the pinnacle of virtue by many, you know, look at everything that happened with him. Andrew Cuomo from New York, you know, uh, writing, has the balls to write a book called Lessons in Leadership, you know, is held up by CNN as a potential, um, you know, presidential uh, candidate. And uh, and look at all the stories that come, that's come up from him. So it, it happens across the board, whether it's politics, music, entertainment. My, my big fear, yeah, is that normally in these situations, this is just the start, you know, uh, now everyone's going to come out of the woodwork, you know, who feels empowered and brave enough to share their terrible experiences with, uh, with Ellison. And as much as the accusations of pedo have been thrown at him, um, you know, which, which are a little farcical considering that she's 19 and that even though he's 56, pedophilia is based around actual age, not age gap. Um, you know, again, 19 is uh, it's skating close to the line. And I, I, I dread to think if there's somebody, um, you know, somebody younger who he's, he's been consorting with, uh, you know, what that's going to mean for him. I'll tell you what it's going to mean for me. I mean, right now the episode stays up. Uh, you know, I'll I'll, uh, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt that, you know, that the girl's 19, he knew she was 19, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, yeah, if, if, any, if any more bullshit comes out, I mean, I'm going to have no choice but to yank that episode, which sucks because... Um, you know, it was a uh, it was a pretty high performer for me, but um, you know, ethics are ethics. Uh, and again, I just uh, I I just do not understand why why anyone would put themselves in a situation like this. But I did say um, I think last year, and I've said on a couple of occasions that this sort of story is going to come out about a great many people over the next couple of uh, months and years. Um, I have been backstage uh, and overheard too many conversations between too many high-profile musicians to not be absolutely convinced that there are, I think, at least 70 to 80 percent of high-profile musicians in the metal scene, you know, have got skeletons like this buried in the closet. I would never have thought Dave Ellefson would be one of those folks, um, you know, and I consider myself a pretty good judge of character. So probably based on that, the odds are raised to 90 percent. Um but yeah, it'll be interesting to see who's next, and it'll be interesting to see what happens next. But uh, I, uh, the main thing for me, as I said, is I I feel for um, I feel for David's family, and I feel for his wife because um, you know they're about to be put through humiliation and just straight up fucking bullshit that they don't deserve. Uh, moving on, Satyricon's frost on veganism, plant based foods uh, seem to make the body happier. You will hear that. Uh, or you'll recall, if you listen to uh, the episode in full, that Blake and I spoke about this as well. I know he's moving to uh, a plant-based diet. Um, I, I think that uh, the whole debate about plant-based or no is a lot more complex than uh, than a lot of folks make it out to be. And then there's, I mean, I, I don't, I don't have the knowledge off the top of my head to go into detail about it, but I've read an awful lot uh, to suggest that actually, for some people, a plant-based diet is not good. Um, I know for myself. Um, you know, I discovered this through, uh, I wouldn't say through trial and error, but just through, through personal experience. So I, um, 
you know, I've, I've always been a, a pretty big meat eater, but, you know, I probably had a lot more variety in the amount of meat that I would eat m more often than, uh, than I do now. Um, I, I really discovered through uh, a guy named Stan Efferding, who's the proponent of something called the vertical diet, um, and generally speaking, is a fucking brilliant man. And if you are interested in anything to do with nutrition, one, follow him on Instagram, but two, for sure, check out any of his podcast appearances. I mean, frankly, as much as this is into the necrosphere, I'd fucking love to have him on here because he is, um, you know, I, I've, I've gained an awful lot from uh, the stuff that he's spoken about. Uh, I think he's a fucking great guy as well. Uh, but anyway, uh, one of the things that he was talking about was how, uh, you know, whenever he has trained athletes in the past uh, or whenever, you know, folks have had challenges with things like high blood pressure, et cetera, et cetera, he's actually increased their intake of red meat. And that's typically helped the problem out. Um, you know, Mark Bell is somebody who I know he's pretty close to. If you know who Mark Bell is, um, you know, he's a, a you know champion uh, weightlifter. Um, you know, and again, very cool guy, guy that you can follow on uh, on the socials. He was also the brother of Chris Bell, who directed Bigger, Faster, Stronger. So again, if you if you you know if you're in that world, you'll know what I'm talking about. But anyway, I I started upping my intake of uh, of red meat following um, you know a couple of those podcast appearances that I heard, and frankly, I have never felt better. Um, my you know the amount of weight that I'm able to shift at the gym increased. Um, my testosterone levels increased my you know the, the quality of things like my sleep increased my energy levels increased um, and any any time that I've had a week where I've eaten maybe more chicken or you know just just cut down on red meat as a whole I tend to feel crap and I think you know part of it is you know based on your blood type um, but also part of it is based on you know what you tend to eat or what you've kind of grown up eating and if you eat a certain kind of food a lot your body um, you know I believe becomes and it's not bro science there's more behind it than than just that um, but i believe your body becomes efficient at uh, at processing that particular food so you know plant-based foods will work for some people or plant-based diet will work for some people if they feel better for it great for me um you know i uh i i, I personally don't think it works for me and and you know like i said to uh, to blake I'm fine with anybody eating whatever they want. I just don't want to be lectured by somebody about what I should and shouldn't eat. You know, I'm not going to run around telling Frost, stay hey, listen, this vegan diet is a load of fucking bullshit, nerd. You need to start eating more steak. Um, I, I just, I, but what I what I do find annoying when it comes to the plant-based folk is the fact that, you know, we constantly, constantly have to hear from them how much better plant-based diets are and meat is terrible and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I uh, just thought I would uh, I would comment on that. Um, you know, I, I see that, you know, Blabbermouth quotes an article by Vox. Big surprise. Vox, the biggest load of shit on the face of the earth. By the way, also, if you watched my episode with Nick Sagis, a, uh, a publication that uh, at one point ran an article where they um, uh, presented the uh, the theorem that um, the uh, the members of MS13 are actually just nice boys who ride their bikes. Um, I mean, that in itself should make anything that they post from there on out fall into the category of instant bullshit. Um, there's another article here about Satyricon apparently uh, creating an unpredictable, creative and innovative new album. Uh, if it is uh, as unpredictably terrible as Deep Calleth Upon Deep, then uh, they can fucking save it. But either way, uh, it says here, Satyricon drummer Frost has confirmed to the Heavy Demons radio show in a new interview that the band is working on the follow-up to 2017's Deep Calleth Upon Deep shit. There will be a new album in 2022, and we will continue to be unpredictable and creative and innovative, I hope. That flame has never died in us. It's still burning. We're moving ahead, and we're still evolving. Um, one thing that does give me uh, some hope about the Satyricon record is the fact that um, uh, Satyr was uh, posted something on Instagram, and they, they talk about it in the article, uh, a, a photo of him with uh, Snorra from um, Thorns. So I'm hoping that uh, some of Snorra's um, grimness will uh, will rub off on this new record, but um, then again, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, he's been talking about how the new album, and when I say he, I mean Satter, has been talking about how the new album is going to be something very different and will feature different instrumentation to what anybody's used to in black metal. That, to me, instantly raises alarm bells. Um, and again, sad that a band that uh, is so influential and, you know, that I have loved for so many years 
has gone down the pan to quite such, to, to quite the same degree. Uh, I'm going to do one more article and then I'll be done. Um, so this one I thought was interesting too. Philip Anselmo on Pantera's The Great Southern Trenkill. I was in a superbly dark spot when we did that record. Uh, you will have seen that I bit my tongue when Blake was uh, was dissing Pantera on the show. Um, I don't know why people don't like that band. Anyway, I mean, for me, I'm, not, I'm unapologetic about it. They were hands down, when I was a teenager, the most influential band in my life, bar none. Not Metallica, not Guns N' Roses, not anybody. For me, a vulgar display of power and far beyond driven is the gateway that got me into everything else that was heavy. But not only that, I mean, you know, whether it was, you know, dealing with the girlfriends and leaving me and, you know, the bullies and all that sort of shit. I mean, it was it was that, that that those those were the albums that that genuinely spoke to me i love phil's lyrics i love the whole vibe of the band uh you know and i will love them until the day i die that being said uh i was a little surprised by this uh line in the article 1996's the great southern trend kill is pantera's most extreme and abrasive album hands down Characteristically defiant and contrarian, the band followed up its number one billboard charting far beyond driven with an LP that was far beyond confrontational, musically experimental, sonically bombastic, and lyrically scathing. I I think that to call that album their most extreme and abrasive album, you are out of your fucking mind. If you if you put Far Beyond Driven into the C D player uh, and mistook it for the Great Southern Dren Kill, maybe you would do that, but it's definitely not their most extreme, and it's not their most abrasive, and it's certainly not their best. I think, um, in in terms of uh, of qual- I mean, firstly, in terms of of the the album versus Far Beyond Driven, no contest. Far Beyond Driven is an album where even the deep cuts will grow on you. Uh, you know, as the you know the more that you listen to it, it really only has, in my opinion, one really shit part, and that's a good friend and a bottle of pills. Uh, the rest of the album is fantastic. Whereas the Great Southern Trend Kill really has three excellent songs and then a bunch of tracks that, you know, I can take or leave, quite frankly. The excellent songs being Tens, which I think might be one of Pantera's best. Um, I think Floods is a great track. Uh, and I think Suicide Note Part 1 is a fantastic song, marred, unfortunately, by the fact that Suicide Note Part 2 is utter shit. But, um, yeah, I, uh, I, 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 you know, bully for them that, you know, the 25th anniversary of the album has come around. Um, you know, but but for me, I if I've listened to that album in my whole life more than twenty times, I've listened to the songs that I mentioned, you know, two thousand times. But you know, the album the album as, as a whole for me was massively disappointing. It still is, and in part it's because it wasn't as as badass and aggressive and heavy as Far Beyond Driven. So uh, that's my my view on that. Uh, I would still absolutely love to have Phil Anselmo on the show, though. Um, you know, if I think about wish list guests for episode 100, I mean, he's you know one of the guys at the top of the list. But uh, we'll see um, if uh, if I can uh, if someone knows someone who knows someone, <laughs> then uh, then put me in touch with uh, with brother Phil. Uh, and on that note, uh, I believe that uh, it has time to uh, to finish off the news for this week. That also means that it is time for me to uh, bid all of you a fond farewell. Next week, I will be back with Andrew McIvor of Code. Um, I spoke last week about how much I enjoy that band. Uh, and so uh, naturally, as I was talking about it, I thought to myself, hmm, I need to uh, I need to hit the man up and see if he's interested in coming on the show. He was blown away by Into the Necrosphere's cult credentials and said, yes, of course, Jackie, uh, even if it's the only interview that I do in uh, 2021. So uh, I'll be recording that very shortly, and that'll be with you next week. Uh, I also still have my show with um, Chris Canella to do. Um, I, uh, I had that scheduled for the recording of that was scheduled for this weekend, but uh, I realized foolishly that I had scheduled it clashing with my daughter's seventh uh, birthday celebrations. And frankly, you know, she has to take uh, precedent over everything. And then I have a couple of other guests in the pipeline. Um, there's a few folks that need to make repeat appearances on the show, too. Um, I'd love to get Sam Bean back on at some point soon. Uh, you know, I feel like we were we were just hitting our stride about uh, two and a half hours into that chat. Um, so he needs to come back on. Mike Hill needs to definitely come back on as well. It'd be great to catch up with him again. Um, and uh, Cheyenne from uh, Trivax. Um, you know, again, I think we had to cut that one short. So uh, that'll be uh, that'll be fun to uh, to do a part two on. But either way, I want to say thank you very very much to everybody who follows the show, everyone who continues to show their love and support. Uh, and to all of you that manages to make it through the day without jumping on Zoom and jerking off in front of a 19-year-old, 
<laughs> I salute you. Uh, this is uh, a track that I mentioned I was going to play to you earlier. Uh, it's off the third Glory or Belly album uh, entitled Meet Us at the Southern Sign. came out in 2009 uh, on Candlelight Records. Uh, as much as the uh, latter-day Glory or Belly doesn't quite cut the mustard, this album is absolutely fucking fantastic. And the track that I'm going to be playing for you is called Once in a Blood Red Moon. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> 